Thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, I'm very glad to be back at Columbia. Um, it's been a few years since I've really been back in the building. Um, I'm glad that the food truck guy still yells at me about white sauce. Uh, but um, I want to come here and talk a little bit about some of the work we've been doing in Google Research, uh, both on the consumer side and then some of the work we've started in, on the healthcare side. Um, this talk will be a little bit different than probably most of the talks you are familiar with in that uh, most PIs will come up here and talk about a lot of the work that they've done themselves. Uh, I've done almost none of this work. Uh, <laughs> most of this work is done by hundreds and hundreds of people, uh, both inside of Google and outside of Google. Uh, but I'll give you a flavor of the stuff that we're working on at Google, um, as, uh, especially around machine learning and AI. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions to the extent that I can answer them. So obviously, I have a number of conflicts of interest. For one, I work at Google. Um, I sit on some boards of hospitals and some uh, advisory committees of the government. And nothing I say here is a reflection of what uh, any of their opinions, but are purely my own. So uh, many of you are, have probably seen machine learning in one respect or another. Uh, the old way of doing things is to uh, actually write out rules, try to get, use human in intuition to figure out how you might uh, figure out a particular problem. So for example, on this slide, we're talking about how you might classify spam. And this is actually something that even Google did uh, 15, 20 years ago, where we had hundreds of engineers literally figuring out how you might write Bayesian classifiers uh, to figure out whether an email contains things like uh, sp uh, Viagra, et cetera. And this is, actually turns out to work fairly well, as many of you know. This way of uh, working is very laborious. It actually does work fairly well, but um, one of the things that many researchers in the field tried to do was figure out if there are other ways to do this. And an ideal way to do it would be you can simply feed the system a lot of examples of things that work and a lot of examples of um, things that are not spam and try to get the system to classify it itself. So it turns out that um, <laughs> uh, it turns out that uh, the old way, even though many, many people folks have spent a lot of time working on it, um, it's actually pretty hard to do and it requires a lot of human ingenuity. That's why you had decades of computer vision scientists, NLP specialists, trying to write rules to figure out how you might distinguish A from B. So this is just an example of the type of problems we deal with on a daily basis where it's actually really hard, as you can tell, to figure out rules to figure out these two classes. Um, as I mentioned, this is basically just using handcrafted uh, features. Um, actually, my own PhD here was done using handcrafted features where you literally do things like histograms of pixel colors. You try to figure out where lines might be on the picture. You give the computer some idea of how many lines there might be on the picture, etc. cetera. Um, and it really, the classifiers really didn't matter very much. Once you figure out what, what uh, handcrafted features you build, you basically just tried all 50 algorithms and you see which ones really work and which ones don't and you write your paper based and write your thesis based on that in my case. Um, the, the quote unquote new way of doing it, um, it's to try and see if you can use certain machine learning algorithms that can really sort of do all of this in the background. Um, I'll give some caveats later about how easy or hard it is to really just do this end to end, but it turns out that for at least for some classes of problems, this actually works pretty well. Um, so what I'm alluding to, and many of you have probably heard the hype term at this point, uh, is uh, neural nets. So neural net is actually something that is very simple in practice. Um, it's basically a binary classifier that you stack thousands and thousands of them in a layer, and then you stack many, many layers on top of each other and you let the computer basically figure out how each of these neural nets connect to each, uh, each of these perceptrons or neutron, uh, neurons connect to each other and based on how they connect to each other and what the weights are, uh, basically coefficients if you think about it as linear regression, um, it somehow figures out how a certain classifier or a certain feature is learned. It uh, tries to actually model what the brain theoretically is supposed to be doing. Right? We, many of you probably took some version of neuroscience where uh, clearly there's some activation energy and then it gives some sort of binary or graded uh, threshold. And using that, 
somehow connected in interesting ways in the brain, we're able to do very interesting things. So this is a way to imitate biology and somehow it actually seems to work. Uh, one of the really tough parts about deep neural nets is, as you can imagine, it's very, very computationally expensive. So for a long time, the concepts of deep neural nets actually came about in the 1960s and the 1970s, but for a very long time, you couldn't really use them. Uh, it wasn't actually possible to train any neural nets that of any significant size to do any problems because the computation of power wasn't there. In the last 20 years or so, there's been significant advances both on the computation of power and actually on a, a number of mathematical techniques to train neural nets that led to the ability to actually do speed ups in the order of um, multiple orders of magnitude that allow neural nets to actually be possible. But even then, you're still talking about potentially training for multiple days and sometimes uh, months. And what's interesting when you look at these neural nets, um, as I mentioned, you basically have these layers. So um, you can f think of a layer as a number of neurons that are connected to each other, and then different layers as, um, the, as connections between uh, these layers. And if you look at the layers and you try to inspect what the layers are actually learning, um, this is an image classification problem. So the input data is essentially some version of an image. So let's say it's a 256 by 256 uh, pixel image, and you feed it into a neural net. And what you're interested in is, let's say you care whether this is um, a blue image or a white image, or a cat or not cat, whatever the problem happens to be. Um, I'll just use an example of a uh, uh, neural net called ImageNet. It has uh, 23 layers. And what we see from the neural net, if you are, try to inspect some of the layers, is that on the earlier layers, it seems to learn things that are roughly very gross features. So it seems to learn things like line detectors. It seems to learn things like gradients. And then once you proceed into further layers of this network, it seems to start learning more and more complicated things. It starts to learn what textures are. It starts to learn what cat and mouse might actually look like. Um, this is a very, very highly gross generalization, but Roughly, it seems to actually operate in a very similar way as you might expect cognition to work, in which the earlier layers are learning high-level features, and later layers are actually refining that decision uh, to figure out what these images might be. So uh, as I mentioned, basically all of this is just some way of doing statistical correlation. And the way you learn by example is basically literally you have a loss function. So loss function might be you know, how close you are to getting the right answer. And the machine learning algorithm is just iterate against the weight. So this is um, uh, a joke that we use in recruiting. But basically, the, the computer will randomly guess an answer. And you tell it that, for example, in this case, 65 is actually a terrible answer. 121 is the right answer. And on the next iteration, it will try to guess a number that's closer to 121. And it will keep doing that. So that's all deep learning is. There is nothing particularly fancy about it. It's just a very good guesser that's tied together with a loss function or some way to measure how good um, a function it seems to be getting. So, um, so given the context, I want to talk a little bit first about the consumer use cases that we have and then go towards some of the healthcare use cases that we have. So one of the really nice parts about deep neural nets is that it can work on lots of lots of different applications all at once. So instead of us going, uh, let's say we're trying to figure out uh, an imaging problem, instead of us building image-specific classifiers, um, you can have neural nets learn things that are not just image-specific. Uh, you can apply them to audio, you can apply them to text, you can apply them to uh, various different things. In fact, you can take things like images and actually output text. Um, so you might have seen examples where some of these neural nets can now actually generate uh, textual descriptions of what's in the picture. Uh, you can actually, for example, go from audio to try to figure out what the audio actually says. So in the past, there's also a lot of Bayesian techniques where you map the audio to different phenomes, and then you use a bunch of Bayesian techniques to go from phenomes to what those words might be, uh, all based on basically priors. In this case, you, we try to actually go straight from the uh, spectrogram straight to what the text might be, um, versus different types of translate, etc. cetera. So uh, one of these things that uh, it allows is to map um, closely related images to another type of image. Uh, so for example, this is a nice site. There's now a version uh, by Apple and the new um, Apple phones where we basically gave the computer a lot of examples of what the same place might look, at, uh, look like during the day and what the same place might look like during the night. Uh, 
and have the computer try to figure out what is the transfer function between day and night. Um, as a result, the, the computer is actually able to figure out from very, very difficult to impute signals, because uh, when you go to the very dark, many times the pixels are actually a very similar shade, um, what the other picture might look like. So most of this is actually uh, done in software on the Google phones. In uh, 2006, we joked about the fact that we can auto-reply um, emails. So in 2016, we actually built this feature originally first into Inbox and then into Gmail, where this feature basically looks at the text of the email and looks at your typical responses um, and try to guess what, is your, what might your reply be. Uh, in 2018, we actually built it into um, a continuous prediction as opposed to just doing it at the end of the email. So this is, uh, those of you who know neural nets, it, this is called a recurrent neural nets, which happens to work better for text data. And one of the things that recurrent neural nets are, are able to do versus uh, the generic CNNs is recurrent neural nets are, are, in some ways, have some sort of thing we roughly call memory. So it's able to, instead of just predicting, uh, for example, actually this is how translate used to work, where you predict word for word what the translation might be, and then you do use some NLP tricks to try to line up the grammar. This way you can actually remember phrases um, and actually understand how an entire phrase might be translated. It's one of the reasons why Google Translate now um, sounds much more human versus what you might have seen four or five years ago. It's also one of the reasons, and, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, when it makes mistakes, it tends to make really weird mistakes because it will interpolate for multiple words. Um, and you probably have seen online various people sort of trying to find those phrases on Google Translate that translates in a really weird way. Um, it, and this is a general problem of deep learning. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of this is essentially interpolation, right? It, it learns with data and tries to project out what it might be. So if it hasn't seen the data before, unlike the typical models that you would build uh, using physiological understanding or using an actual understanding of the data, um, if it hasn't seen the data before, it tends to go really haywire. Uh, and that's an issue that many people are trying to address today. Um, as I mentioned, we're putting this technology into almost everything. Um, partly because uh, everybody is very excited about ML at Google and partly because we've actually made a lot of the tools very easy to use. Um, some of you might have actually used TensorFlow or other techniques, that, uh, other uh, software that we've open sourced. Um, some of the stuff that I mentioned is in Photos. If you use Google Photos, you'll see that we can automatically figure out if um, a certain tag should be on a photo that uh, isn't tagged by a human. Um, it's actually kind of interesting how good the technology is these days. Uh, even in cases where we have, um, we have some team members that have identical twins, uh, the model can figure out the difference between the identical twins, including from sort of zero to uh, 10 years old, 12 years old. It can somehow learn uh, from the data how a person might progress uh, through, through different ages. I still can't tell babies apart, so that's a different matter. Um, <laughs> Uh, I mentioned some of the stuff we're using on Gmail as, as well as Translate. Um, many of you might have heard about AlphaGo, which is a, um, uh, a uh, piece of research that we did out of our London office um, around trying to get a computer algorithm that can learn how to play uh, the board game Go. The board game Go isn't uh, actually very difficult to explain, but it's actually very difficult to play. Right? So roughly, it is a game in which you have uh, two players that are trying to command the board by blocking uh, out areas of the board. And the number of configurations on uh, things like the goal board is orders of magnitude higher than what exists in chess. And what's really interesting uh, in terms of AlphaGo is um, if you look at what happened in the development of computer chess players and look at what IBM did in Kasparov, um, that system was basically a lot of rules codified into a computer learning system. So even though that system was an amazing chess player, um, it's not it's, it's, we didn't learn anything new about chess from that, the, from that computer player. Um, it basically just summarized and learned all the, uh, from all the human moves and then played sort of what is probabilistically optimal. Um, AlphaGo is actually quite different. Um, if you have seen some of the matches or heard some of the matches, uh, you might have heard about the fact that AlphaGo made a number of moves that was extremely unconventional. 
uh, for humans to actually play. And the reason why I was able to do that was it initially learned from the system, um, but afterwards it started learning uh, the game by itself. And the way you do that is you ended up building two neural nets. So we had a neural net, um, both are actually pretty hard to build, but we had a neural net that figured out at any point by looking at a board, how, who's basically winning on that board, which is actually a non-trivial uh, neural net in itself. And then a separate neural net that figures out, given a certain chess conf uh, uh, goal configuration, what is the next move that you'll actually make. So you need both, of course, in order to play the game, because otherwise you don't know whether you're winning or losing. Um, and then after learning from humans, you basically ask the system to play itself. Uh, and the system played itself millions and millions of times. Um, and ended up picking sort of the best, uh, the strongest systems to play in both South Korea and then in China. Uh, and in the South Korean case, we actually lost the game um, in a move that uh, was also very rare for the human to make. Uh, when Lee Sedol was playing, he actually purposely started playing moves that he doesn't normally play. So the computer started getting surprised. Um, and by the time we got to the Chinese player, uh, the, the world's strongest player uh, around a, m a few months later, uh, we actually retrained it, the system quite a bit more and we won all the games against that player. And you can, you can read about much of this work and actually there's a, I think a Netflix documentary on, on AlphaGo. Um, but it's one of the first occurrences where the game can actually teach humans about some of the moves that it can make. Uh, now, um, they took it a step uh, further and created this system called AlphaGo Zero, which works even better than the AlphaGo master system that we built and actually does not um, need to look at human moves at all. So what this system did was it basically got fed the rules of the game only and was then asked to play itself also hundreds of millions of times and within around 30 days of training, and this is 30 days of a lot of Google computing power, so I wouldn't necessarily try to do it at home. Um, but uh, the system was able to beat the original uh, system that was trained on humans, um, and is able to learn brand new strategies that um, was previously unseen. So, so we actually did the same thing in chess, and chess you can actually do on your home computer. It takes around 24 hours or so to just adapt the system. We have, we have a paper also in Nature about the um, AlphaGo chess player. Um, it takes about a day of training and you can get to a point where you can beat uh, almost all online chess players. Oh, sorry, almost all online human and computer chess players um, with just a, a 24 hours of training uh, with no previous games being shown to the computer at all. Um, so this is all, I think, very, very exciting. Um, the computers have managed to essentially learn a system directly uh, and share a lot of insight back to the human that previously they have never seen before. Um, this is uh, an example of um, now more advanced things you can do on deep neural nets. So um, you might have heard about uh, this art project called Deep Dreams. So this art project looks at the classification uh, networks that we typically use to do um, discrimination for images. And then we basically selectively amplify some of the layers. So what I mean by that is let's say you have an image. So let's say you have this particular image. Um, and let's say that you are trying to f you, you're trying to figure out if there are cats in this image. So when you feed it through a deep neural net, certain, it will have a certain score of how likely there will be a cat. Right? Let's say the score is 0 0.05, because it's not clear to me there's any cats here. Um, you then try to perturb the input uh, image. So you try to change the image, uh, input image by adding noise, by adding other things, um, so that you get a higher score of classifying a cat, or you get a higher score for classifying a dog, or a Monet picture, or whatever it happens to be, that happens to be the target. And that allows you to sort of both look at the model and see why it might be making decisions, but also to generate really interesting images. So this is an example of the original images of Deep Dream. And you can see, um, once you would ask the classifier to, for example, figure out from the first image, um, and amplify the signal for, uh, sorry, uh, for towers, you can see that buildings are showing up in this image because those buildings are what would give a higher classification score for buildings. Um, on the second image, you can see that I think there's a mouse and birds and weird things in the second image. Um, the, uh, oh, I don't have a pointer, but the, 
bog in the middle, I think is actually kind of cool. Now that I, I can't unsee it after I see it. Um, but this is uh, originally sort of designed just to probe the deep neural nets and try to get a better understanding of what the neural nets might be doing. Um, but one of the things that we also see is, for example, in this case, uh, we took a generic image of barbells um, and we did the same thing. And you see that arm chart is showing up in the image, which is kind of weird, right? But um, one of the things that we realized is the reason why arms showed, uh, showed up in the image is if you look at the universe of images online with barbells, very frequently there are arms in the data set. So it's not surprising that the thing that will, the, will um, improve the recognition of dumbbells is actually dumbbells and an arm. Um, so this points at one of the issues uh, that I've already alluded to, which is the training data sets very heavily biases deep networks. Um, it's not nearly as good as I think what some people might suggest. Um, and you have to be very careful with a lot of these deep neural nets that you build. But this application is also actually quite helpful in, in different ways. So the fact that these deep neural nets can, in fact, uh, correlate things that are related to each other but not, for example, uh, well-known, or in the case of bar barbells and arms, um, sort of generally known but not codified in the programmatic rule, is you might be able or you might be interested in learning those relationships directly from the data. Uh, so this is a technique called embedding. It turns out to be very, very helpful. Um, for example, you can learn things like what you saw in the image, but you could also learn relationships directly. So we looked at uh, a lot of data uh, from Wikipedia, and we tried to then look at the embedding layer to see if you can, in fact, automatically build relationships from this data. And it turns out that, in fact, from the embedding layers, the neural nets, in the process of learning those predictions, also learn their relationships, for example, between countries and capital. And in fact, it can sort of automatically derive that. And in fact, you can do essentially uh, some sort of 3D or 4D embedding arithmetic, vector arithmetic, and actually figure out things like tenses, relationship spouses, etc. So this technique is now actually quite heavily used on, on NLP processing in deep neural nets, uh, including in, in the healthcare sciences that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, to learn things that right now you do a ton of human abstractions on. Uh, so for example, doing things like SNOMED encoding, which is right now quite painful to do. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of uh, briefly talk about general adversarial networks uh, before I jump into some of the healthcare use cases. Um, the most recent things uh, in deep neural nets that I think folks are generally excited about and now is causing a lot of uh, controversy is this thing called GANs, um, which is a also two neural nets that are attached to each other that are trying to figure out how to fool each other. So roughly, um, now that you know how to discriminate an image, so you know how to, let's say, figure out whether an image has a cat or not, um, maybe you're interested in drawing out images that have cats directly, as opposed to just figuring out whether an existing image has a cat or not. So what General Adversarial Network does is it uses the same type of layout uh, same type of network topology to actually both figure out whether an image is a cat or not, but also to learn how to draw one. Um, so it allows you to do interesting things like, uh, for example, mapping different images to each other. You can replace things, like you can learn, for example, um, how to fill in holes in images um, or switch animals in a picture. But what recently you might have heard a great deal about is around deep fakes. Um, so most deep fakes are done by general adversarial networks. Um, you can go online, you can search many deep fakes. Uh, there is a pretty good uh, one about faking Obama's voice. Uh, but now uh, you can actually do it on video as well. You can basically map somebody onto somebody else uh, using general adversarial networks. Um, so this is an example of, uh, for example, doing it on style transfer. This is a uh, less controversial application of it where you can uh, basically map an existing picture into a different style of um, classical artist uh, in real time. So you can actually do this, um, I believe, on Google Photos today. So uh, there's a lot of different techniques, and many of which are not invented at Google. Many of these techniques are invented um, sort of by the computer science community uh, in the last decade. Uh, but we've sort of started to use a lot of those techniques now inside of Google, in consumer products. Um, but in the last few years, we've also started to see whether 
those techniques can be applied in healthcare specifically. Uh, as you can tell, imaging was one of the first areas where that technique matured. So we first started to do a lot of work in uh, medical imaging. Medical imaging is nice in that it has several properties, uh, some of which is thanks to the um, physicians here. Uh, one is it has a lot of data, um, especially in imaging, it has a lot of data that uh, frankly is over uh, overdone. Uh, so in examples where there are lots of positives and lots of ne negatives, you end up give, having enough sort of variety of data for the machine learning to learn. And the other part is increasingly screening protocols. Um, there are not enough physicians, not enough radiologists, pathologists, etc., to actually look at all those images. So it's helpful as a problem uh, to be looking at how AI might be helpful there. Uh, I'll, I'll run through a lot, uh, some of these slides uh, fairly quickly, but uh, one of the places where we initially did the research is around uh, diabetic retinopathy. Uh, it's an area where um, basically the problem boils down to getting a number of retinal images uh, using either specialized scanners or increasingly you can use uh, consumer grade scanners of the eye, um, and then trying to figure out sort of how much disease exists in that eye uh, has existed. So right now, roughly on the clinical side, there's a grade between one to five. One, you can say, is basically has no disease, and five has very severe disease. Um, and getting that um, uh, score helps clinicians figure out how to manage that patient. And um, this problem is one of those problems where, uh, as you can imagine, seems to fit very well in the deep learning image classification type problem, where you have lots of images, uh, you have a grade, and we can basically do an A to B type mapping problem. So that's exactly what we did. We got uh, quite a few images. We got around 130,000 images, both of a combination of partners in the U.S. and outside of the U.S. Um, and then we asked a lot of ophthalmologists to actually overread the image. Um, it turns out that the image quality matters, uh, the image read actually matters quite a lot. Um, many of you have probably seen in a lot of deep learning problems, or actually even non-deep learning problems, that in cases where you have a lot of noise and it doesn't take very much, in, uh, especially in clinical records, you can be off by 10-15% of noise, and many times classifiers have, unsurprisingly, a lot of problem trying to learn what the real pattern is in the data. So um, this is one of our first projects, so we sort of went overboard and we said, let's try to at least head off that problem. So we hired around 50 ophthalmologists and we had every single image out of that 130,000 overread by something like 11 to 15 times. That means every, every image was read uh, on the order of 11 to 15 times. Um, and then we did a consensus um, and other types of adjudication where we actually got people into a room and tell them to figure out what the correct answer is for an image. And we used that as the training sample uh, as well as testing and validation for this network. Um, once you have that data, it turns out that existing uh, neural nets actually work very, very well. Um, we basically just plug it into Inception, which is, uh, actually, oops, sorry, which is actually open sourced. Um, you can find uh, Inception basically on Google's website. It's uh, basically a image, uh, imaging neural net that we train on consumer data um, that is freely available. As I mentioned earlier, one of the things that these, these neural net learns is in the lower levels, it learns things that like how to find edges, how to figure out if an image is black and white. So starting the classifier with, starting the project with a classifier that already has learned some of those things um, in order to start off this problem turns out to be very, help, very helpful. And this is a process in, in, in a deep learning called transfer learning, but essentially it's just using a neural net that happens to um, already know something about how to do image classification and then feeding it medical images specifically and see how well it does. And it turns out that it works uh, very, very well. Um, so I, I briefly mentioned it turns out that the data integrity issue is a very, very big deal. Um, the data integrity issue is a very big deal actually generally uh, in healthcare, as you guys know. Um, adjudication of imaging is at least somewhat easy. The outcomes data at a place like Columbia, where some patients might end up at Sinai and other places, um, is a problem that, whether it's deep learning or not, everybody continues to tackle. Um, the other issue is that it also turns out that physicians don't really agree with each other. Um, so these are, to be granted, not, not trivial cases. Um, but when we looked at, so each uh, row is an image, uh, sorry, each column, is, uh, each row is an image and um, each column is an ophthalmologist. Uh, 
So you can see that ophthalmologists uh, don't agree very well with each other uh, about a grading of uh, you might not be able to see. Um, <laughs> oh, um, oh, I see. Uh, you might be able to see that ophthalmologists don't really agree with each other. Um, this is particularly acute in other places. I think in imaging, at least, uh, there you can eventually get to a consensus. In places where uh, I know some folks here work on sepsis, uh, there is very wide disagreement of what sepsis even means um, and what does it mean for a patient to be critically unstable or things like that. So, um, but setting that aside, we had this complicated process that we eventually got the folks to agree. Um, and it turns out that we can build a model that is at least as accurate as generalist. Uh, this is a result that came out uh, in 2016. Um, and actually recently, uh, it's either in press or already out, we have uh, papers that demonstrate that in fact we can now reach a uh, specialist uh, level um, uh, performances in these algorithms. Uh, one of the things that we also learned was it was it was in fact overkill to overread the images that much. It turns out that you don't have to overread the training set that much. The networks are actually able to tolerate uh, the, a decent amount of noise, not, not an ex excessive amount of noise, but a decent amount of noise in the training set. But it matters a great deal on your test set that it, that it be very, very accurate. So a lot of our more recent projects, we've basically shifted towards making sure that the uh, test sets have been overread quite a bit, as opposed to the entire uh, data set. Um, and this is just uh, one of the ways we've done Robinhood uh, adjudication, just to make sure that, in fact, we can come to a consensus of, on the test set, what these grades actually are in these images. Um, uh, I'll just briefly mention, so some of these results uh, have gone beyond publications, and we've actually started to run pilots of them. Uh, the, this particular project is now CE marked. Uh, we've submitted to the FDA, and um, <coughs> we're now running pilots in certain countries uh, where we're actively screening patients. Um, what you would actually really like to do, uh, as opposed to making predictions against what a physician thinks is the progression of the disease, is to, of course, figure out how the disease might actually progress and measure directly against outcomes. So uh, this is true not just in ophthalmology, this is true in oncology and everything, right? You don't, it's, clinicians have a lot of knowledge that they've learned over decades and personally, and over hundreds of years from their attendings, from their uh, faculty members, but some of that might not be complete and some of that might not be as accurate as they think. So what you would ideally want, for example, in the case of eye disease, is maybe you're interested in figuring out how you can map the image of the eye to what actually happens to the pa patient 10 years down the line, 15 years down the line, et cetera. And this is where um, I think there's a lot of exciting work going on, but there's a lot of exciting work on a very limited set of data sets. Because as you can imagine, the only way to do this type of research is a data set already has to exist. Right? You need some sort of MESA or Framingham or whatever large set of cohort data that have already existed running for 10 to 15 years to even get that outcome data. Um, but there's an area where uh, a lot of uh, different researchers are right now spending a lot of time working on. Um, the other area that I mentioned earlier around style transfers, uh, you can also try to do, for example, style transfers um, in medical imaging. So one of the things that has been very interesting to both folks inside of Google and outside of Google is to figure out, is there a way we can pull out more data from imaging or from other modalities of data that will allow us to decrease um, the cost of care or increase the access of care. So for example, can we take CT images and get the data that we would get from a CT images from just the x-ray? Or in this case, uh, this is a technology called OCT, which is a really, really expensive eye machine um, to look at a certain type of disease, uh, basically a, a edema in the eye. Um, can we get this data from just a normal retinal image data, uh, uh, normal retinal image scanner? So uh, a very similar type of technique as you saw in Nightshot was basically applied to this problem. So we gave the uh, computer algorithm a lot of examples of these pairs and says, can you figure out how to correlate from one to another? And it turns out that, in fact, the algorithm is able to correlate it quite highly and can generate the second image quite well. Um, uh, this is also a paper that was out in Nature last year. <laughs> and um, 
the question, of course, is what else can you see in this data? So I talked a little bit about the things that clinicians currently f look, uh, we look, we built some computer algorithms that, that try to emulate what physicians currently try to extract out of, out of these data sets. Are there things that physicians cannot extract out of these data sets that might still exist in the signal? So we um, actually asked one of our um, uh, machine learning engineers to look at, for example, can you look at a retinal image and figure out the gender of a patient? Uh, this is, of course, somewhat of a toy problem because you probably, that's, this is not the best way to figure out uh, the gender or sex of a patient, but we wanted to see if, in fact, it was possible. And it turns out that, in fact, you can get a very, very high AUC on this, uh, which means that there is, in fact, data somehow in that retinal image that gives you this information. Um, we actually try to figure out where the signal is coming from. Uh, we did different things that you can do. We blocked out different parts of the image. We cut up the image, et cetera. And um, the models weren't able to do it when we did that. So somehow there is, the data is not just coming, uh, the signal is not coming from just the optic disc or just the nerves. Somehow it's learning from some gross features. Um, that is picking this up. So that's actually a particularly interesting finding. Um, it turns out that you can also pick up things like age directly from the retinal image. Um, this is a pretty good correlation. Um, uh, you can figure out things like refractory error, which are, you know, uh, actually quite a few of us seem to have glasses here, um, are, are that weird things that people put up to your eyes to figure out how to give you prescriptions. Um, so uh, there's quite a few things that you wouldn't expect, things like systolic blood pressure, uh, in fact, even things like uh, Framingham uh, risk scores that you, could, you seem to be able to pull out from the signal uh, directly without potentially other, other types of modalities. Um, this is, I think, in some ways expected, in some ways not expected. Uh, in some way expected, uh, I'm sort of saying this frivolously because I think you know, those of us who've spent a lot of time in healthcare have probably heard some attending at some point say that the eye is the only place where you can non-invasively see the vasculature, so we should be able to diagnose everything. So attendings have been saying that for decades, um, so it's not totally surprising that this is doable and there's some signal here, um, but I think the results are probably surprising to most people that it can in fact actually, uh, those type of results can actually be pulled out. Um, we've done very similar things on uh, other types of images. This is a, a lung cancer image, is actually uh, lung cancer CT. You can, uh, I'll speed past some of this, but you can basically do very similar types of things in lung cancer CT, unsurprisingly, um, and extract signals that you might not see before. So this is an example of a patient um, who, the, the left image is the initial diagnosis, the right image is uh, around a year later where they finally picked up lung cancer. And at that point, the patient had a stage three lung cancer. And lung cancer, as some of you might know, are, is um, once you get to stage three, um, it's quite, the mortality is not uh, great. So uh, it turns out that the computer algorithm can figure out from the first image that there is likely cancer there. And we show this result back to the radiologist. Um, they were actually able to see it, but initially when we asked them even to overread the original image without the guidance, uh, five out of six of them did not uh, see it. And on the initial pass, no, nobody saw it. Uh, so it's quite difficult to see. Um, similar things, of course, in pathology. Um, I'll please for some of it. Uh, but basically, you can do very similar things, uh, unsurprisingly, with pathology images. Um, although pathology images, uh, of course, are multiple orders of magnitude bigger. Um, ImageNet is typically in the order of 128 by 128 pixel, whereas this is in the order of 10 gigapixel per image. Um, I'll briefly dive into microscopy just to show you examples where other, uh, this type of data is getting used. Um, some of you have probably uh, seen on the newer cameras, newer camera phones, that we've done a lot of different types of camera effects, both in terms of things like portrait modes and uh, coloring of images, etc. So a lot of this was all built on the type of image to image transformation that I mentioned earlier. Um, so we wanted to see if in fact uh, a similar type of technique can be applied in healthcare. Um, these are more examples of, of interpolations. So can you, for example, go from a certain type of biological image, uh, for example, from transmission microscopy, and directly predict what the staining of an image might look like? Um, and it turns out that uh, you can do this pretty well. Uh, this is a face contrast rat neuron uh, photo. Um, this is the fluorescence that you would uh, get out of it. 
Um, and this is where the prediction. So you can see that um, we killed a cell at 3 p.m. Uh, around 3 p.m. But otherwise, the predictions are pretty good. Um, so a lot of these techniques are basically abstracting signals out from images that are typically very hard for humans to interpret, but clearly is somehow embedded in the data itself, and then trying to pull this data out. Um, I'll briefly talk about uh, some other applications as well. This is uh, around medical records. Some of you might have seen the deep learning paper uh, come out around um, the fact that we had a number of healthcare systems, deep neural nets, uh, uh, medical records, and we tried to build a, build a deep neural net around different things like mortality, et cetera. Um, and it turns out that you can, in fact, build decent models uh, from neural nets on this type of data as well. Um, there was a lot more uh, hacks that were involved here, and I'm happy to talk about it later uh, if you have questions. But um, much of deep neural nets right now are, uh, in some way, sort of trying to pretend that your data is an image. So if you have heard about uh, some of genetic algorithms, it literally sort of interpolates the data into an image and then just runs the traditional imaging algorithm because that field has matured greatly. Here, we didn't quite project an image, but it essentially is very similar to that. And using similar techniques, as I mentioned earlier, you can actually do some version of interpretability uh, where you can actually extract some data out. Um, so some of the les lessons that we've learned. Um, it turns out that neural nets are not the solutions to everything, uh, unlike what we say publicly. But um, this is an example, for example, uh, of looking at sex predictions in MRI. Uh, we did sex predictions from the retina. So we want to see, for example, is it possible to do a similar thing for MRI images? It turns out that uh, when we first built the models, we had very, very good performance. Um, and usually when you have a 0.99 performance in machine learning, it almost always implies that you've screwed up something. Uh, usually you contaminated, train, and test, or you did something to screw up the data. And one of our engineers decided to look at um, maybe if we just cut out a portion of the image and do the prediction there by itself, um, see whether the, how good the model is. And you can see that the AUC dropped quite a bit. So what the neural net was actually learning from was the facial features in the MRI and actually not the brain. Um, and it was actually quite hard to tell. Uh, we actually did a very similar thing in um, the radiology project. So the radiology project is a project uh, using data from TCGA, which is a pretty uh, famous uh, and large cancer data set that is available generally. Um, and we actually wrote back to them that their data has some errors in it. Uh, what happened was when we initially built the cancer data set, we also got a 0.99 AUC. Um, and we actually used some of the techniques that I, I mentioned earlier to try to figure out where was the neural net actually paying attention. And it turns out that there is a very, very faint pencil mark by the radiologist um, on the, I think, lower right-hand corner that, where they did a check mark for every image that they thought had cancer. Uh -huh. So uh, we actually wrote back <laughs> to the CCGA guys and told them that they had to cleanse those images. Uh, it was actually not visible by eye normally, um, but it was uh, a gradient that did exist in the images. So generally, if you can build a deep neural net that has 0.99 AUC, uh, you almost certainly screwed up somewhere. Um, uh, to give you a comparison, I think neural nets, uh, even on Google's imaging, uh, stack tends to be in the 0 0.95, 0 0.96, 0 0.97 range. So 0 0.99 is a very, very, very strong result. Um, the other thing is uh, a lot of this data depends, as I joked about, very heavily on image quality, very heavily on input data. Um, you, as you can see, this is an example of uh, we artificially basically blurred the images um, and try to see how well or how poorly the uh, models would perform. And unsurprisingly, the more you blur the data, the poorer the um, image quality is. This is an example of a prediction from our pathology uh, neural net. And you can see that it highlighted two areas of concern. Well, the, the red areas are areas uh, that the neural net thought has cancer. So you can see that there's a strip of blue on the, uh, on the right image, sort of on the first thing on the left. Um, so that's kind of odd, right? You usually you don't have cancer, and then you have a strip that isn't cancer. So we wanted to see what was going on. Um, so it turns out that even on very expensive scanners, as they are scanning, parts of it goes out of focus. And um, the model, of course, couldn't figure out what was happening there. Uh, 
and decided to say that it was not cancer. We then actually bought a number of scanners from the uh, market and then realized that in fact many of the digital pathology scanners have significant imaging artifacts. So uh, you can see clearly this scanner does image rasterization. Um, it basically scans in a line and has different variations. Um, this other scanner seems to have some sort, this is actually a, we think is a prep issue um, that uh, the tissue isn't completely flat. So there's a bulge that shows up in the uh, scan. So this is all to say that um, all of these techniques uh, rely on the fact, and it's part of the reason why computer scientists uh, are increasingly partnering with uh, those with biomedical knowledge, a lot of domain expertise to figure out whether you're even solving the right problem or whether the results actually make any sense. Um, I'll also quickly mention this and then I'll stop for Q&A because uh, I would love to hear what you guys think. Um, we've done some feasibility studies on the pathology work. Um, given that we have a pretty good classifier, uh, why don't we give it to pathologist and see how well, uh, how well this algorithm will do with pathologist. Um, of course it's going to be amazing. Uh, it turns out that physicians were actually slower and more error prone when they got the models. So what we learned was UX matters a lot. Um, physicians really, really are, are really attached to their workflows. And two, it turns out that physicians also don't really know how to deal with probabilistic models. So they really need models that are either highly, highly sensitive or highly, highly specific. They need to know when they see an image basically to trust the results one direction or another um, so they can either move on <coughs> or really look at it, really examine an image. In cases where you tune somewhere in the middle of the um, ROC, which is what a lot of computer scientists do, because you want to tune for both sensitivity and specificity. Um, physicians get very confused because they feel like they have to read de novo every image anyway, and for every finding that you see, they have to now spend even more time looking at those findings. <coughs> so they end up actually with uh, worse results <coughs> uh, than had they been looking at the images themselves, and were actually slower. Um, so. Um, I sort of did a whirlwind of various projects that we worked on, um, but I want to sort of stop there, and I would love to take any questions that you guys might have. Thank you.